JN Life Class family, welcome to another episode of the JN Circle Thrive Together Life Class series. I am your host, Kamala McQuinney. I'm an associate clinical psychologist and super passionate about all things well being. And I'm really happy to be back in another season sharing space with you all this evening. So, our conversation this evening is going to be titled Trauma and Triumph Getting Past Your Past. And I want you just to welcome into the room. We're going to be having some good energy conversations as usual. So if you haven't had a chance just yet, reach out to our sister and our brethren and tell them life class is back on and invite them to come into the room with you. All right. Special mention this evening to our in-studio audience members. Can you make some noise? Audio members? It's so good to hear real live applause in a room. <laughs> and to be having conversations with real reactions. I'm really grateful this evening to be back with you talking about something so relevant and so necessary. With me to have this conversation tonight are two, three amazing panelists, and I'm going to give you a brief intro, and then I'm gonna allow you to hear their voices. So this evening we are joined by Kiki and Toms. She is an author, and so many other things which I'll tell you about momentarily. But Kiki, just for now, just say hi. Hi, everybody. Happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent. We're also joined this evening by Sarita Thompson. Welcome, Sarita. Hi, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's good to have you in the live class. Welcome. We're going to be joined virtually this evening by another amazing powerhouse of a guest. And she is Dr. Sharifa Wilkins Calhoun. Welcome, Dr. Calhoun. Thank you for having me. Awesome. All right. And I see so many people in the chat. Welcome, Ebby. Welcome, Nicole. Welcome, Denver. Big up on yourself. And please get comfy as we're about to go right into it for life class for another episode. Before we get into the meat of the matter, I'd like to get some feedback from our virtual audience members. And so we're going to queue up our audience poll. We call it our Thriver Meter. And we're going to be asking those who have access to this to be sharing their feedback on a couple important you know prompts mm -hmm. the first one is how would you describe your current mood yeah and then you want to go into asking persons to give their understanding of trauma and a couple other pieces of feedback just five questions just to get a kind of level setting about who is coming to life class and what they're looking forward to hearing more of from life class so our tech team has the poll up for the persons who are joining us virtually, just go ahead and give us your best feedback. And in a few minutes, they'll prompt me and we will show the results of what our poll has to say. All right. So now back to the amazing panelists that we mentioned earlier, right? So Kiki is an author. She's also the CEO of Love Self Love International. Mm -hmm. You are also a distracted with that amazing voice, <laughs> right? And she's also an executive producer. Many of you would have seen the series Real. Life, life yeah. on TVJ. Yes. yes. All right. So Kiki, how are you doing today? And tell us a little bit about what makes you so passionate about this conversation. Um, I think for me, more than anything else, um, mental health, wellness, well-being, um, pivotal. It's, it's crucial to anyone's development and mm -hmm. growth process. Um, and so for me, having gone through as much as I've gone through in my life, um, anything and any advice, any suggestions, any experiences that I might have had that I can impart um, and help one person even, you know what I mean, to have a different perspective on how to live a better life, then that means that I feel more more, more at ease that someone ha is on a journey, you know, to, to probably living a better life than they were before. So I think that's it for me, just being able to impart knowledge and uh, wisdom in any way I can. Excellent. Well said. And that's very similar to Sarita's story. Mm -hmm. So Sarita Thompson is a mm -hmm. communications consultant and also a mental health advocate and activist. Sarita, tell us a little bit about you and what makes you so passionate? What brings you into these kinds of conversations? Um, well, like you said, it's very similar to Kiki. Um, I had my first panic attack when I was 25 or 24 thereabouts, and it was very traumatic. I didn't know what it was, and it took, it took a while to actually for me to be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. But then even when I was diagnosed, I remember bawling because 
mental health, like a mental illness means I'm mad and mad people go to the hospital and I didn't want that. And so for a very long time, I refused to take my medication because I was afraid of the stigma that was attached to the mental health, the mental illness. I didn't want my friends to know. I didn't know what my bosses were going to say. And so I'm really passionate about this subject because I don't want anybody else to feel the way I was feeling back then. So I want to do as much as I can do to make sure that people are aware of what a mental illness is, specifically anxiety and depression, because those are the two that I have experience in. Mm -hmm. But um, this is just my baby, really. It's, it's really close to my heart just to increase awareness and make sure that people know that they're not struggling alone. Mm -hmm. Other people are out here in the struggle with them. I love that. And that's what Life Class is all about. As you will hear from the name, it's called the Thrive Together Life Class series. Mm -hmm. And it went live in the pandemic because JN, the JN group realized that a lot of us were struggling in our little corners. And just coming together even once a week was a good space to just help us to realize, oh wait, other people wonder yeah, this or don't know about this and to just build that sense of you know, safety um, in community. So thank you for the work that you have been doing, Sirita. All right, and joining us virtually is Dr. Sharifa Wilkins Cahoon. Doc, she is an author. I will soon, soon tell you about her book. Uh, she is a licensed counseling psychologist and a family therapist. Dr. Cahoon, welcome, and how are you doing today? Hi, thank you for having me. Doing okay? How are you guys? We're good. We're good. And I'm loving the colors of the panelists. I think you look very beautiful on the screen. That's just me, <laughs> but I think so, right? So, Doc, tell us a little bit about, like, you know, what brought you into this kind of work and why these conversations are important to you. Okay. All right, so my background, actually, I have an undergrad in journalism. Wow. And <laughs> after... <laughs> After um, I completed my undergrad, um, I was given an opportunity to teach. And while I was in the classroom um, at a high school, the high school that I graduated from, so that was an opportunity for me to serve uh, my alma mater from Technical High, um, I found that I was in the classroom listening more to the emotional issues that the students had, the behavioral concerns. And it was just very hard for me to go through any curriculum to do any teaching. And it, it, that's when it dawned on me that really and truly uh, counseling is really, psychology is really for me. And I think my childhood, um, having gone through serial migration where my mom met left when I was very young and how that took a toll on me and the trauma, you know, and just so many and instability growing up, you know, it, it really made sense um for me to do this and I realized this is what I was created to do that's my purpose so yeah and I find that life class kind of attracts people who have found their purpose and their calling and I love that about this space mm -hmm. right sharing a little bit so far about your story and um, Dr. Cahoon could you also tell us the name of your book and let me just drop a pin here we're going to be doing giveaways later on so you may want to just be you know Hint, hint, just taking close, close note. Dr. Cahoon, please tell us the name of the book that you have so wonderfully authored. Right. So, so the name is From Terror to Triumph, Unfolding the Stories of Migration. Yes. Yes. Right. From Terror to Triumph. All right. So we are now going to make space for the results of our Thrive Meter poll. Do we have that ready for team? Just to see what the good folks are saying. All right. So how would you describe your current mood? Let's see, 64% of persons said okay, and 15% said happy, and 20% of the persons are not in an excellent mood this evening, and we hope that life class can have an impact on just improving your mood. Just, you know, good energy and good vibes. We hope that by the time we finish this conversation, we can shift the needle for you, all right? The next prompt was, how would you describe your understanding of trauma? So 76% of people, that's the vast majority said, a significant distressing event that overwhelmed your ability to cope. And that's how I define trauma, right? Some people think it's just any bad experience that you've had, but it's more than that. So I'm glad, you know, not the majority of our class members said it because that means a lot of people are coming into the room having a good understanding of what trauma is. Uh, have you had a traumatic experience that is affecting your present well-being? 39% of people said sort of, 35% said yes. So we're looking at the majority of our, of our family members this evening who are saying they have had something happen to them that is still affecting how they're coping now. So that's trauma, yeah? Uh, do, you ha do you have hope that you can still triumph despite your experience? 93% of respondents said yes. 
and all of that. So we have a good amount of hope in the room this evening. And finally, what are you expecting from this class? Um, let me see now. So 33% of persons had a better understanding of how trauma can affect relationships of all kinds. 19% of persons are looking for tools on how they can support someone who has experienced trauma. 30% said resources to heal my own wounds caused by traumatic experiences. And 19% said a generally better understanding of what trauma is and what it is not. Yeah. So panelists, this is, this is our assignment for the evening. <laughs> Thankfully, people are coming into the room with a lot of hope that they can shift the needle of their own healing. Yeah. So we want to start off the conversation doing a lot of inspiring, of course, but also some educating. Because I realize a lot of persons do not know really what trauma is. It's used so loosely now that trauma can be anything from going to the supermarket and here say the chicken run out, right? <laughs> and for us, that's not like the experts in the room, all of us here, we know that it's more than that. It's not just any inconvenient experience that we have. It's a little bit more than that. Yeah. But I don't want to say too much because I'm just a facilitator tonight. Mm -hmm. So I want to invite... Um, let me start off with Dr. Cahoon awesome, yeah. to give us a sense back on what is trauma and what isn't trauma. Okay, so trauma, you're right, is more than just going to the supermarket and hearing that the, the chicken ran out, right? Trauma is defined as a, a deeply disturbing or stressful experience. So it has to be disturbing and it has to be distressing and it has to be causing some sort of um, disruption, whether in the social, occupational, relational, emotional, or mental or psychological well-being. And, and, and really and truly, many of us will experience trauma or some traumatic event um, in our lifetime, even if we don't recognize it. Okay. And then, Doc, one of the things that a lot of people hear, um, that I hear a lot of when people reference trauma, people go straight to PTSD in many instances. So a lot of people hold on to like what we see in the movies, like when the veterans, when the, the, the members of the military go off to war and they come back. But that's not the only form. That's not the only way right. that trauma actually manages. Right? No, so no, no not, at all. not at all. Not at all. Right. And that's, that's where it initially started um, with army veterans. But no, it affects individual and it is connected to anxiety, stress, depression, even relationship issues. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things is that we have not um, understand that trauma, we've, we've actually normalized our pain. We've kind of suppressed this and we aren't aware of the connection and the mental health issues that come along with trauma. Mm -hmm. and, and based on even the National Institute of Mental Health, they say that seven or, or eight people out of a hundred people will experience PTSD. But we know that depression is more, way more common. You know, we know that anxiety is way more common um, than even say PTSD but it do have its root in that. Absolutely. And so Doc, what are some of the types of trauma? Because one of the things I don't think we realize enough of as a people, and we're hoping to change that with our conversation this evening, is that there, there is, for example, vicarious trauma, which means that sometimes we don't personally experience the traumatic event, but we, somebody close to us yeah. experienced it or we witnessed it in our community. So that's one right. type of trauma that so talk to us a little bit more about what that can look like. Right. So we have we we have acute trauma, which can result from a single incident, like a car accident. You're in a car accident and the car was spinning around and around several times. And you know, that affects you, and you found that you found that your heart was racing, palpitations, stuff like that. That's acute trauma because it's one single incident. And you probably have not experienced anything that was as distressing as that. And then we have what we call chronic trauma, which is, which is repeated and prolonged trauma. And I see more so chronic trauma because people are in it, they normalize it and they ignore it. And they don't realize that what is happening is actually trauma. And it happened for years and years and years. So for example, when people come to me in my office, clients, you know, when I begin to unpack their history, their trauma history, I realize they've had trauma upon trauma, you know, um, and they stay in it, as I said, and they suppress it and they ignore it, not realizing. Um, so domestic violence is, is a trauma. 
you know, and many women stay in, in those kind of relationships where there is violence, um, abuse, and abuse can be verbal, you know, somebody putting you down, calling your names, labeling you. Um, we have sexual trauma, um, we, we involve sexual acts and so forth. And our, our, our society, especially Jamaican society, we, we have been so quiet about this specific trauma. There's so much incest in families, you know, where loved ones or, you know, uncle, whoever it is in the family um, are abusing, sexually abusing um, the person. We also have physical trauma where there is wound inflicted upon, upon one's body, skin. You know, we have also have emotional trauma, which can also be traumatic, which can come in the form of manipulation and so forth, putting down, letting the person feel belittled and so forth. And we also have complex, complex trauma, which is really exposure um, to varied and complex trauma. And it's, it's usually very, very in, invasive. And most people that I see that, for example, develop depression or even say PTSD would have experienced some sort of complex or chronic trauma over a period of time for them to develop, you know, some mental health issues. Of course, a one-off issue, depending on how the brain um, processes that and the individual, a, a person can, you know, develop any sort of mental health difficulty. But those are some of the, the types of trauma. Yeah. So one of the things I, I want to just amplify based on what Doc said is there may be persons watching, and I think you're probably attracted to this conversation because maybe you as, a, as an audience member have experienced trauma. One of the things we want to say to you is that there may be some words or phrases or experiences mm -hmm. shared this evening that may feel like a trigger. So if at any point anything is said, we don't intend to cause harm, but we know that just based on how trauma operates, it right. may just push some buttons. So if you need to step away for a few minutes to keep yourself straight and safe, we definitely invite you to do that. You may want to just turn the volume down and come back perhaps when you see us laughing, right? And do that if it is that you're feeling um, overwhelmed by what we're, we're discussing today. But in the course of our conversation, we definitely want to move through not only the nitty gritty of what trauma is, but also shift into solutions. So we're going through stage by stage, and we're gonna be breaking it up this evening into bite-sized practical things that we can do to support persons who are one, experiencing trauma, to support ourselves if that's our story. And we don't only want to focus on the defined aspects of you know, traumatic experiences, but I wanna open it up to adverse experiences as well. It might not meet the criteria of trauma, but a lot of us have experienced some things that left some scars on us. And those things can look like having had critical parents, partially critical parents. It can look like having had a figure in our lives, like a pastor or a coach or somebody in, in, in authority who was very belittling, right? And it might not be living with us, but it, it has affected our psychology in some way, shape or form. So we're gonna also make room for those things because as Doc said, those things also affect our mental health and our well-being. Yeah. Um, panelists, one of the things I've realized, and you, I would love to hear from you if, if this has been your experience too, is that a lot of people feel like, listen, if it never almost cost my life, I almost don't have a right to feel some type of way about it. So we don't count some things as traumatic. And as Doc said, we normalize them. If it wasn't that there was a gun to my head, for example. So a lot of people in my um, practice are walking around as Doc said, trauma upon trauma upon trauma, but not realizing that adaptic name. Right. So we want to even tonight just name out some of the things so that hopefully those who are watching and those persons here can say, I didn't realize that that was not supposed to have happened to me. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we can then move from there to start taking some steps. Yeah, Kiki, I'm jumping over to you. One of the things that I know that trauma also causes is a lot of shame. Mm -hmm. And according to one of my favorite new authors, Brene Brown, she says that when, when there is shame, shame tells us that we're not deserving of love and we're not deserving of connection. How have you managed any instances of shame in your own life for those who are watching who may be like, oh my God, you know, because of what I've been through, I feel one, two, three different negative ways. How do you manage that very strong residue of shame? Um, wow, it's always work in progress. I mean, for anyone who's gone through any form of ridicule, any form of trauma, um, any situation that would have made you feel less than, you know, you'll hear people say, Lord, them easy for shame me. 
And so you might walk around comparing yourself a lot. Someone will say something and it might not feel right with you. It feels very uncomfortable, but you, you don't want to make a big scene. You don't want to be confrontational. So you kind of internalize and you might share it with a friend or some persons might go to the other extreme of snapping. You know what I mean? Like being very aggressive about it. And then others might be like, so where am I going? So what am I behave? So, but what they don't understand is that as simple as they, might have, have taken it the other person did not because it's a trauma it's a trigger for a trauma that is there it means that you know they probably have the insecurities that feed, that are saying um i'm not worthy i'm less than you know and they're probably even awkward in the social environment you know so it's one thing when you see you know children like a group of children and even adults because it's in the workplace as well and they're all hanging out and stuff and somebody says something and then somebody get quiet and then the next person say so I really it's serious. Them take it serious. Make them go on, yeah, man. Me not have time for that, you know. And it, it, what they don't understand is that they're perpetuating it. Yeah. And and ironically, if someone else were supposed to trigger something for them, they would react the same way. So it's lack of empathy, I think. Mm -hmm. So trauma equals. Um, sensitivity in certain areas mm -hmm. and then we're in an environment or a society that lacks empathy because they don't understand it especially coming from you know jamaica where not only boys but also the girls are also you know taught to you must know, toughen up and you know and and the, the 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 sad part about it is oftentimes when someone displays a certain level of being sensitive towards something mm -hmm. you have others who will pick on them for it mm -hmm. true you know what i mean so it's just a whole kaleidoscope of, mm -hmm. of issues but when you once you feel shame um it usually chips away at you and so you have to know change the narrative mm -hmm. i think one of the first things to understand where trauma is concerned is we were not born broken we're all born nobody no baby comes out and says i'm broken i'm this and that they're perfect the way they are so it means that any insecurity you have you would have either learned through peers, parenting, society. And so you really have to own your life and change the narrative as best as you can and come up with some coping skills. Yeah. Yeah. I love what you just said about the narrative because you were talking about this in our pre-class conversation, um, Sarita and Dr. Kahoon about changing the narrative. Have and we're to. going to end up spending a couple minutes well have just to. talking about at least one technique that we can practice mm -hmm. um, as it relates to changing the narrative. But over to you, Madam Mental Health um, Advocate. Mm -hmm. What would you say to somebody who's sitting down right now saying, look here, because Kiki, Kiki don't know what we go through. Uh, yeah, if that's, she did go through that's this. That's another thing too. We'll talk about that. That's yes. another thing, yeah. If she did go through this, mm -hmm. then she would have understand why I feel like I can barely lift my head up and I can barely, right, you know? Right. I think that the most important one of the most important things when you're dealing with um, trauma and overcoming to become triumphant is being compassionate to yourself, being kinder to yourself. So yes, the world has been hard on you. The world has broken you. Maybe you've been suffering for years with you know emotional trauma, but changing the narrative to say, like we, we discussed yesterday, um, I trauma has happened to me. Um, abuse has happened to me but this is it doesn't define who you are so change the narrative as to um you know somebody might have said my good for nothing and i'm not going to amount to anything but that's not that's not the truth that's not you know what i choose to believe so i think that being compassionate towards yourself being kind towards yourself just like you would a friend like if a friend comes to you and say that i'm going through this like you're not going to beat down on the friend you're going to be really compassionate about how you respond and i think we need to do more of that for ourselves because it's easier for us to beat on ourselves and cause ourselves some trauma than it is for us to actually you know impart it on other persons i want to encourage persons out there to be kinder to yourselves to be more loving to to you know be more sympathetic to the way you think about yourself, the way you talk to yourself, because self-talk is really important. There is power in words. And, you know, if it is that you are beating up yourself and belittling yourself, it's not going to be helpful. So it may seem hard at first, but we need to change the narrative. We need to be more compassionate. We need to learn some coping mechanisms as to how to become more compassionate, how to, you know, help ourselves, because we are our own advocates and sometimes our own worst critics yeah, yeah. And, and can i say something sarita you said that point you mentioned about speaking kindly to ourselves it is so hard to do sometimes 
until we think about would I say this to Kitty? Right. Like would I look into Kitty face and say, you know, say you, you know, say you don't. We would not do that in many cases, but it becomes so easy. We normalize telling ourselves the harshest of words. And I heard somebody say that it wasn't until an awareness came out of the sky, Dr. Cahoon, that I'm actually abusing myself. Like if I were to say this to my partner or to my friend, it would literally be considered abuse. And sometimes we normalize that we are speaking to ourselves, unfortunately. So I love the clarity. And before we leave, I think we can share some affirmations mm -hmm. that people can hold on to. Because sometimes people say, where do I start with the self-love thing? Like, you know, you know, <laughs> so. And sometimes we have to practice it. Yeah. Um, I, I liked what Sarita had um, said earlier. And one of the things that we also have to pay attention to when she had said it is, um, or you had said it, sorry, when you had said, um, Kiki can sit on the talk or Sarita can sit on the talk because they don't know what I've gone through. And it's almost like an underlying competition sometimes yeah. as to who who's, yeah, trauma Olympics. My trauma bigger than yours. Or if you're not going through nothing, you can't tell me what to do. But trauma is trauma. It no matter if me did book me to and trick down the stairs and almost broke my neck and it traumatized me, you know, versus a more severe experience, Important. you know, yeah. so to speak. But trauma is trauma. So it's really not a competition. The fact is, if you have gone through anything at all in your life that's traumatic and majority of us have, then we need to extend some kind of empathy mm -hmm. towards someone else who is saying, hey, you know. But what it is as well is that... um our triggers are so normalized and we are judged for it. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you're having a bad day, something happens, it's a trigger. You respond a particular way. And it's rare that someone will stop and say, yeah, you all right? Like genuinely, are. no. The mother take it and say, you know, you want to know what happened? Me just go over the gutter to share you while I go and share you. You must know, share you, go on. Mm -hmm. I want to share you. And it's like more. Trauma, <laughs> even being compounded on what Sherry's already going through. You know, um, I heard this statement once that we almost seem like we're also addicted to emotional porn. And what that means is literally, I need to hear your trauma, the to, to the details of it, to validate yes. or, or, or friendship or validate that you can par, can you get it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and when we do that, sometimes it robs us. It puts us in the passenger seat of our lives mm -hmm. as opposed to the driver's seat. So when we get into those um, instances, it's almost like we look at other persons and say, yes, because we celebrate winning. Yes, I'm celebrating that they are winning and they've overcome, but I don't think I can do that. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful as well how we look at the whole perspective the whole process it and the final thing i want to say is also when i'm traumatic now. yeah for now for now because <laughs> i'm going to hand over to you but also trauma and this is a very it's a tricky thing to understand but a traumatic experience happening to us does not necessarily mean it's going to be trauma for us trauma literally means so if someone comes in and i know their levels right but let's say an incident happens what takes place when that incident happens is our brains start replaying the incident. And depending on the narrative that we're telling ourselves, either we're going to relive that experience and it takes seven to 14 days for the incident to now become trauma for us because we're reliving it. And once we start reliving it, anytime at all we think about it, it takes us right back to where it was. And so one year going to turn into two, going to turn into possibly 20 right? Until we're able to tell ourselves in the now, this is not happening to me right now. I have to find a way to feel safe in this moment right now. Yeah. And that's weird for people to understand because from once the instant incident happens and it's, it's an adverse thing, it happened externally, it wasn't of their doing, something happened to them, automatically everybody is just going to say, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, how could this happen? How could this happen? But no one stops them and says, all right, in this moment, I need you to understand how your brain works and what is going to happen if you continue replaying this, if you continue giving yourself a narrative, if you continue thinking it is your fault, why this happened, and you continue with that story, you are setting up the trajectory for your life for the next couple of years. And how trauma victims usually get over it is when they say, whoa, wait a minute, I cannot take on the mistake of someone that was done to me 
and continuously live it nonstop because it just means say, me abuse myself, whatever they did to me, I'm going to do it to myself for the rest of my life until I learn to release it, heal from it and let it go and put it right back there which part it belong. Someone broken hurt me, it hurt me deeply, but I cannot take on their brokenness and add it to my journey because then I'm robbing myself of a chance to live. Mm -hmm. So you said something that I want to amplify here and I'm coming over to that immediately after this point, right? A couple of things to bear in mind. One, sometimes having a traumatic experience does not mean that it will continue to live with us forever. We can resolve it, we can integrate it and we can um, resolve it so that we, it doesn't stay with us. Not something that's spoken about a lot. Right, so, so not every traumatic instance means that we are bringing it for next month and next year and the rest of our lives. So that's important to bear in mind. And that's why for this evening's conversation, I want to be mindful to not only focus ex explicitly on like the theoretical aspect of what mm -hmm. trauma is, but why need to talk about difficult situations. Right. And that's why for me, the title is so apt, right? Mm -hmm. From trauma to triumph, because not how we go through all different things. Mm -hmm. And it might not meet the clinical definition, Dr. Cahoon, of a traumatic experience, but it might you know, look like something else. So that's one important thing. And I love the point that you made about how we sometimes have the trauma Olympics, right? Where it's like you say, so so you say you're pussy daddy? <laughs> like, yeah, and then what happened? Because I must something else happen. Why you come to work and I cry? Yeah. Because when I grew up, I have a for post. I'm never really clear. Like, them dead all the while, them born and then I will bury them. Yeah. So uh, that, that you really cry for? Yeah. That, that, that's why you can't come to work today because mm -hmm. you need leave for the fact that your pet yeah. has passed away, yeah. right? So I think it's very important. Somebody said it in the comments. It's very important for us to em empathize. Okay. We don't have to go through the identical things to be able to say to somebody, I feel you, or I understand how this can be difficult for you. You understand? Some people might go through a breakup that might be traumatic. For sure. And Jamaica people have a hot style to say, they're not, they're, they're going to make man mad you. Look on the tree and on your face and you're nice and clean. But and you are going to make one woman son mad you out. And, and we go off and we go on. So in case you're watching this evening, this is what life class is about. To talk the real things then so that we can move into our solutions, solutions. and into a better way of being. Right. Because if you have an opportunity tomorrow to sit and look in the face of someone who has experienced trauma, we hope from this conversation that you will make different decisions about what you say and what you don't say. And I'm looking at Sarita because you know says Sarita the Wally for this, right? One on one and also through her articles and so on. Yeah. So Dr. Cahoon, the panelists have already kind of just in the in the in the process of conversing, kind of named some of the ways in which trauma affects our behaviors. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the others. There are things like hypervigilance, for example, that comes into play when people have a traumatic experience in some instances, right? Hypervigilance right. is one of them. Difficulty with relationships. I'm going to talk about the rest. Let Doc teach us, right? The things there. <laughs> right. So uh, somebody alluded to the fact that um, trauma is like we're reliving it, right? So flashbacks where you have glimpses of what happened. That's another one that's very common. Um, nightmares. Uh, people have a lot of those and it's usually surrounding the trauma, you know, almost like they're reliving it. So disturbance with the sleep. Um, people are also depressed, irritable, get very irritable, very snappy, very, if they're triggered. Um, so there's mood issues, mood swings, and, and there's instability with the mood. Um, those are some of the things. And I just want to draw attention to the fact that trauma, when it gets tucked in the brain, is something that we need to pay attention to because when trauma happens, it's frozen in time. So if you were raped at five years old, even though you're 25, that brain, that trauma is stopped at that time. And trauma is usually stored in the hippocampus region of the brain. And we need to grow it up in time. So even though you're 25 and the trauma happened when you're five, it needs to heal. And it's important to go back and revisit that trauma because when it's tucked in the hippocampus of region of the brain, it's the emotions that is affected. There's no words. So the way we do healing is by processing it to get it unstuck. And we do that by using time sequencing to go back 
to what happened when you were five. Tell me about what happened when you were five, right? We use language as well to make sense of it. And that's where we desensitize it. And that's where we reframe it as well. And sometimes you have to get to the point where you say, but it really wasn't my fault. I was only five years old. The person that abused me was supposed to be there as a protector, as a nurturer, as a caregiver. So you come back now and you revisit those narratives, those cognitions, and that's where you make sense of it. Change those narratives, change those cognitions, reframe it, see it through a different lens, then you file it away. That's what we call a processing trauma. And that can be done through trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy by talking about it, going back in it. It can be done through what we call EMDR, I movement desensitization um, reprocessing where we go back into it and make sense of it and reprocess it and it can also be done through narrative therapy where you change the narrative and look at okay this happened to me it happened already I can't change it but I can have a, an alternative story I can have a unique outcome so even though this thing happened to me it doesn't define me it's not who I am and I can use that terror and triumph over that. My mess now can become my message. And my pain so can become my purpose. zone right now, you know. <laughs> but that is speaking straight facts. And I love the feedback from the comments. I saw where Denise H was saying, listen, everybody, um, she said some people's pets are to them like family, going back to our previous example. And based on what Doc was saying, a couple of things jumped out at me, even in, in relation to that scenario. And it's the meaning that Sarita and Kiki that we make about our experiences. Mm -hmm. So for example, even outside of trauma, we can walk into a room and everybody turns and stares at you. And we can interpret that in a myriad of ways. How many of us might feel like it's something good while people staring at us? No. All depends, all depends on how, how confident you are. On how confident you are. How you mm -hmm. you no trauma, then you just went in. Exactly. They're looking at me. Exactly. And if you have trauma, you say, Jesus Christ, we just want to repass it on. Come exactly. again, brother. <laughs> right. It was a friend of mine that people stare at me a lot. And to me, I felt like I'm, I'm like a super giant and I look oh. almost a freakish. Gorgeous. And one day, my friend said to me, Kamala, you are striking. Gorgeous. You're striking. Meaning it's hard not to look at you. And I was like, well, it could be a good thing. Yeah. Because I was legit just focused on. It must be something. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and that's like in a very pedestrian example, just yeah. like a regular thing, much less something like a parent leaving. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and based on what Doc is saying, when she talk, talks about how trauma pretty much becomes stuck. It's like it freezes us in time. So we have some people who are 37 and 35 who are literally operating like their seven-year-old self when mommy or daddy did or did not do something or when an uncle did or did not do something, mm -hmm. yeah? And so the point I'm trying to make is, especially to drive home the issue of how important empathy is, we need to realize that somebody can see the water bottle and somebody can come and take it away from them and it means more to them than a bottle of water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somebody could lose a job, which is a source of trauma for many people. And it's not just about a job, it's about identity. It's about you how valuable, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's about how my partner is going to see me when I go home or not see me. Yeah. And so, even for the parents who are watching, I want to leave a special word for them because sometimes parents say things like, Can I see a car mm -hmm. Right. And parents try to tell you how to feel about certain experiences. So you can see your body shape. I feel mm -hmm. like you have a strong word to drop on it right on that point. So mm -hmm. Go ahead. I did actually have something to say about parenting, but I mean, we can, uh, this will come in the, the next segment about trauma and how it's normalized in Jamaica. But I find that parenting sometimes can be traumatic. Um, parents sometimes traumatize their children without even realizing it. Um, Dr. Sharifa mentioned emotional trauma and it's so commonplace in Jamaica to say things like, yeah, idiots, you fool, fool, you come like a what list, things like those really affect children and it, it, it hinders mm -hmm. their, their ability to think of themselves with oh, confidence. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I wanted to say, but it will come in the next segment. Thank you for dropping it from now. It's very um, much valid. Wow. When it comes on to trauma, because trauma is just so real to everybody like everybody can relate 
to the pain because we've all gone through it, but we can't necessarily get fully what the person is going through. So when someone is saying, I'm in pain and there's no one listening or no one gets it or I feel alone, that narrative alone mm -hmm. puts them way behind the eight ball as opposed to moving them forward to getting healing. Yeah, because the moment you start feeling alone, the moment you feel like there's no solution is the moment you're literally trapping yourself in the box. And another thing as well, and I don't want to be devil's advocate here, but only because I'm saying this only because I've done the work, only because I've gone through the trauma. And it's not just the physical abuse alone. I've gone through many other traumatic experiences and had to pull myself up by the bootstraps to realize that ain't nobody coming to save me though. So if it is that my mother didn't know what she was doing or my father didn't know what they were doing at that time and they did certain things that were traumatic to me, I'm going to have to let that go. If they created the mess, it's my responsibility to clean it up because they ain't coming. And the thing is, we also attach to this thing because we're so childlike. We're very childlike. Like if trauma happens to us, most of us, trauma happens when we're young. And that trauma, as Doc says, stays with us. So we're very childlike. And because of that childlike approach, there's no one whispering in our ear to tell us that you have to let go of the villain in your story. Because half of us are walking around as adults, but children, very childlike, holding on to this fact that I have to have a villain in my story because the villain in my story makes me feel that it was not my fault. But in doing that, you're not going to get healed. The opposite to that is it was not my fault but it is my responsibility to find a way to release it and get over the trauma. And trauma also includes forgiveness. And when people hear that word there, forgiveness, shut down instantly. Forgive who? Forgive what? What did I, what, what am I forgiving? Because we still think that forgiveness is for the other person. We don't realize that forgiveness is for us and our healing journey. Mm -hmm. So we have to let go for the villain in our story. And holy for people don't want to hear that because of the harshness that was inflicted in them and or on them. And for them in the childlike mind, it's unfair. Mm -hmm. If somebody is raping you, that is the highest form of trust being broken because subconsciously, all of us still want to hold on to a fact or the belief that there's still good in mankind. Mm -hmm. And when somebody does that to somebody, that is the highest form of trust just being broken right there. Like it's, it's unfathomable. Mm -hmm. But is it something that we can survive from? Yeah, but we're going to have to find somebody to help us guide us through it. Yeah. We'll have to have support. And so for me, when I hear persons even talking about, um, you know, abortion and whatever it is, I'm not going to go down that road. But I'm saying if a woman gets raped, and she chooses to have an abortion, that's on her. But where are the systems in place to support her if she does want to have the child and bring the child into this world, but she needs the support to get over the psychological trauma that was imposed on her? You know, so it's a different way to look at it and we'll really have to change the narrative. But I just mean to tell everybody right now who's gone through the trauma from the dog dying, losing the job to being raped to the physical abuse to, I believe, I feel traumatized by the way our government runs this country and I'm not political. I'm talking about from donkey years back. I think they've abused us and it's traumatic for me, but ain't nobody coming to save us. We just have to accept what it is, do our best and put things into perspective. But trauma happens on many, many different levels, but you have to become the superhero in your own story. Mm -hmm. So please do drop some powerful gems and the comment section is similarly just um, buzzing over there. We have so many responses, even as you were in the middle of your sentences. Mm -hmm. One of the things that persons were responding to is when you said um, the how important it is to let it go. Mm -hmm. And all of us were nodding because we agree. Someone very rightly said it's hard to do that, especially when there is depression. It is. Because depression is a cognitive disorder. It's a thought disorder. So it tells us what it's like. It's a repetitive That's one. thought process. And as you mentioned, repetitive, somebody went on to say, sometimes it's not that you want to hold on to it, but the triggers are still in your environment. And Tiffany is spot on because that's not easy. Very true. And somebody came in and said, yeah, man, especially if that's the case, support becomes necessary. And that's why we're having the conversation. Which is why I'm saying And that's why we're welcoming the voices too. We have yeah? to. But again, you said... Someone had said sometimes it's hard because of the environment. Because the triggers are still in the environment. Very much so. Yeah. 
but when are we going to when are we going to make the choice is what i'm saying like healing is a choice healing is a choice and it's not just a willy-nilly choice because there are many different levels to healing you'll go through a wave and it rock it to the core mm -hmm. and sometimes when the healing is happening it's so painful because you have to relive what you went through that people stop the healing right there and don't want to do it anymore but you will heal from something in a one layer five years ago and it come back to you 10 years later but we still have to make a decision we have to choose and say at all costs, no matter what, mm -hmm. I want to be healed from this. And I'm going to go through all the necessary steps that I need to, to heal in order to do that. Yeah. Yeah, in order to do that. Uh, I love that you mentioned that, Kiki, that, you know, healing, there are so many different layers to it. And when we think about, let's say, for example, we get a cut on our foot. Just think about how long it will take for that cut to heal. And even when the skin grows back, Mm -hmm. exactly so and we hit it up and it it hurts again and that's exactly how it is with emotional healing sometimes we're okay today and we're doing good and then we're triggered and then it comes back and we feel like we're struggling again but have to continue doing the work we have to continue choosing to heal it really is our choice it's not something that's going to happen to you nobody's going to come and save you you have to do the work mm -hmm. and it's hard work but it's worth it. it. It really is worth it in the end. Absolutely. And so two very important things which are unsexy truths, I call them. One, nobody's coming to save us, especially if we're adult, adult, like we pass over the age of the 16 or the 18 part of it. Nobody's coming to save us. And it's a very difficult realization. Mm -hmm. And even as a therapist, when I am lovingly confronting that childlike way that many of my clients will show up, I have to say it with empathy because I know that based on certain emotional and mental um, you know, ill health conditions. It's a part of the framework that I am little, I am powerless. They are supposed to do something to help me. But Kiki, you're right. The, the inescapable reality is that we have to make a choice to see healing. The second important unsexy truth that we want to talk about this evening is the fact that guess what? Healing is not a straight line and mm -hmm. healing is not a destination. Mm -hmm. it's, a it's a process it's, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a straight it's line and it's, I don't think it's a place that we just go to and say yay mm -hmm. and heal mm -hmm. I think it's a place I think <laughs> there's a place that we can go to where we have enough resources to manage even in response to triggers which are in my face but we don't get there overnight and we don't get there just by wishing it's hard work of confronting the challenges and, and, and sometimes you have to recommit to the journey I will have mm -hmm. people come to me for support and they come for like three sessions. And when the truth starts to get a little bit too truthful, mm -hmm. when I see them until all December morning, yeah. and they said, are you still living, right? Yeah. They, they, they vanish because it becomes a lot. And it's of course lot. I understand what's going on. It's like, it's emotional labor. Yeah. But emotional mm -hmm. labor brings the results. You know what I mean? And, and it's ugly. Yeah. So that's one of the things I like to say. That, um, this is on yeah that it's it's ugly the whole process of healing is ugly it is tears it's why me it's on the floor curled up bawling it is oh my god this no make no sense we can't do it no more you know like i remember at one point asking if life was a joke no man this can't be life no man this is this that must one joke man this is a puppy show sitting what this is it mm -mm. But the fact is, you just you just have a push through. Yeah. Like, that's the reality of it. Because the fact is, you have one out of two options. Either you heal and have an opportunity of living the life that you were put here to live, or choose not to heal and drown. Literally, like, those are the options. And I'm going to tell you, when you're going through healing, it's going to feel like you're drowning. It's not even going to make sense half of the it time. Might like death, it might feel point. like death unto itself. Mm -hmm. Like I've had, you know, persons who have to call me and say, all right, this is what is happening now. What is this? And I have to tell them, hold firm. Don't worry. It's part of the journey. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you're standing up on the, sh the, 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 the ocean shore and the wave is going to wash over you. You're going to feel like you're going drown, mm -hmm. but you just have to stand firm. You understand? Hopefully it don't box you over too much, but stand firm because it's going to go. Yeah. yeah, so healing is like waves. It wash over you 
when it go back out, wash over you. But for me, what I've been able to do, and I'm so thankful for it, was get so quiet and so silent. And we live in a very busy world. Everybody is busy, sometimes to our own detriment. Mm -hmm. And everybody has too much to do. Yeah, and then we're on social media and then we're watching TV and then we're going to this party or we have this work to do and we have, everybody is like a thing. We just have to be busy. Yeah. But we're too busy to focus on ourselves. Yes, um, we're too busy to just slow down for a minute and take the amount of time that we need to take to really start focusing on ourselves. So when, ex honey, there. When, yeah, <laughs> but when I, I've been unpacking Mm -hmm. I've been unpacking. I'm now 42 years old, about to be 43. And I've been unpacking since I was 19 years old. Mm -hmm. I've been unpacking, you know? So I've gotten to a point now where I can completely embrace because I've been able to identify when my baby is showing up, when my seven-year-old self is showing up. Mm -hmm. I can definitely identify her. You know, I got to the point of saying, baby, Carrie, what do you want to do? What do you want to eat? What do you, you know what I mean? I know my teenage self as well. You know what I mean? I know the different components. And the funny thing is when you heal it's almost like a, a merging happens so you're no longer fragmented mm -hmm. you know it's almost like once you shed light to it and you allow that little girl to heal or you allow that teenage self to heal from whatever it is that you've gone through a merging happens and then you're integration. yeah it's integration literally and, and Phyllis just said it well you must spend time with yourself in silence oh, in oh, order for oh. us to yeah somebody told me a story recently as we're closing this segment Somebody told me a story recently of a friend of theirs who broke their arm right before they traveled. And then where they went to, they did some work on the arm. But when they come back to Jamaica, the doctor then said, but this is not a good. So they had to go to the game in order to do what? Yeah. Fix it back properly. Yeah. Because if it never fixed back properly, as Jamaica people say, should I have a look on? You know that? It would not okay. And so they literally had to do something very painful in order to set her back on the right course. And one of the things that another, maybe a third unsexy truth here is that it takes pain to get rid of pain. And so to our, our panelists, we dropped a very, I think a lot of people have this question in our Q&A box, can the trauma be addressed without reliving the experience? I don't know of that because then we're kind of going, we're skirting it. Mm -hmm. And Doc, Doc mentioned, and Doc, if you can come in, um, if, if, if possible, um, you know, Sometimes yes, I'm here. The issues because it's too overwhelming for us to confront it head on, but then we're not really tackling it. We just uh, go on it. Yeah. So, as far as I know, as a, as a clinician, there is no way. There are ways to do it in a trauma informed and safe way ah, okay. to not overwhelm the clients. Right, right. And sometimes, what's like some modes, some modes of therapy, and for example, sensory motor type of therapy, is where we lead clients into reflecting on how the trauma shows up in their bodies. Mm -hmm. Like, how does it feel in your chest? What is it saying to you? Mm -hmm. And then as Doc was mentioning earlier, we're better able to put it into words because if we can't give it language, it becomes just a stuck pain point in our systems, yeah? So a lot to talk about and so many more questions. Please drop them in the Q&A box so we can pick them up more in a more focused way. But we're about to give something away at the end of segment one of our conversation because this is in fact the JM Circle Life Class and JM is very generous. So we have an Amazon gift card, right? To give away to a member of the virtual audience. And of course the nice people in Udra have come up here today, right? So the first um, question that we have, well, we can't guess which question, right? What the first person who can correctly drop in the chat first and correct entry of what is the title of Dr. Cahoon's book? Ah, you see, I'm going to tell if you drop the pin then. <laughs> no, virtual audience. That's who will come to you. Virtual audience, right? Oh my God. What is the name of Dr. Oh my. Oh my. Oh my. Whoa. So, um, oh my. good. So tech team, you see how fast they're coming in? Okay, great. They're ready to find our winner. Congratulations, Omar. Lisa Franklin Banton was here in our audience last week in person. Oh, Big up yourself, oh Lisa. God. It's great to see you again, yeah. right? Yeah. And then we must give away something to the in-person audience. But first, are there any questions? I'm not working. Are there any questions? Do you want to come to the microphone and say something? Anything that resonated with you or anything that you want to ask? Oh, sure. I want to give my gift already, right? <laughs> Tell us your name. Oh, my name is Omar Ranch. 
I have a question around um, adverse childhood experiences. Yeah. Are they all categorized as trauma? Or if not, when do they rise to the level of trauma? Very good, very good question. So Dr. Um, Kahul is our resident expert on that matter. Doc, can you hear us? Are you able to respond at this time? If not, I'll go ahead. Yes, hello. Um, so very good question from our audience member. Uh -huh. Again. Hello. You know? <laughs> so yeah, so adverse childhood experiences are not automatically traumatic experiences. Yeah. Um, so as we were level setting earlier, and I said, Doc, turn on our, our video. As we were level setting earlier in our conversation, we mentioned that we've all had adverse experiences. I don't know anybody who's going to go through something. But when it becomes traumatic is when it rises to that mm -hmm. level where our coping abilities were overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And so especially in childhood, those, the disruption of those coping mechanisms can look like things like disruption in, in the relationship between the child and the parent or disruption in terms of their what we call animal defense mechanisms. Are they in fight or flight mode very, very regularly? So one of the things that is a symptom too of trauma, one of the ways in which trauma plays out is where we have what we call hyper arousal. I mean, I mean sexual arousal, obviously, right? Hyper arousal where in plain language, people are always on edge. Mm -hmm. Like you're set, you ask the people regular. Mm -hmm. so you are set to fight or you are set to, to flee, to run away. And we also have other responses like fawning, which is like people pleasing. Because when it is, for example, that your abuser yeah. or someone who's mistreating you is somebody who's also the source of protection, mm -hmm. then you learn how to make them happy. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it can be a very thin line, but sometimes they do rise. And I think it will take a trained clinician to kind of figure out, okay, how is this person responding um, to the experiences that they have, the ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and is it traumatic or not? But even if it doesn't rise to the level of trauma, it is nonetheless obviously significant and distressing and sometimes follows people throughout life. Even in the way that we choose romantic partners, mm -hmm. right? we're choosing somebody who talks to a rough, I uh, we sexualize rough talking people, the man they must say rough because somebody who was in our lives was very, very aggressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and all of that aside. But let me hear from the expert, Dr. Cahoon. What are your thoughts in response to that question? I think you answered it already, though. <laughs> Anything else but, you want yeah, to add? Yeah, I agree. Right. So it's it's when it, it becomes unmanageable and it's outside of our ability to cope. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're having all the symptoms or majority of them. So usually when we use the DSM, you know, you would have to have certain criteria out of how many in order to to meet um, certain diagnosis. So there has to be some level of um, dysfunction, disorder that is happening. Um, another, you mentioned the hypervigilance, but also sometimes we have the disconnection and the numbing. You know, that's another symptom of trauma. So people are numb, you know, they're so disconnected from the experience. Um, it's almost like their body shut down as a way to cope. It's a defense mechanism, mm -hmm. you know, and it's also that avoidance. So anything that reminds you of that trauma, mm -hmm. you don't want to do it. You don't want to talk about it. You don't want to go to that place. You don't want to see that car, that smell. And it's a trigger, and it, and it, and if it comes up in the senses, you become irritable or depressed, or you're in that fight or flight um, mode. Mm -hmm. So definitely, there has to be some level of significant distress. Yes. Um, so and I mean, really and truly, ACEs, ACEs is is, is is not is not good. Clearly, you know, it's adverse event, but the distress and the symptoms is what make it trauma. That's right. the difference there. Thank yeah. you so much for that, Doc. We have another question right. from an audience member who says she's not sure that they understand about reliving the experience. Um, just the person said, I lost my husband, he died in my arms. How do I relieve that? Mm -hmm. So I think maybe there was maybe a lack of clarity. But just to, just to go over, Doc, what someone who has had this experience, um, you know, what their journey to healing can look like in light of that. So when we, when we mention reliving it, it's almost like a dread. You know, you don't want to relive it. You don't want the same thing to happen again. So for example, you're afraid of even becoming intimate again or having another husband because you're afraid the same thing. So there's that avoidance, that fear of it happening again. Mm -hmm. So that's what that is. So you you're not necessarily reliving, um, for example, your husband then in your arms, but you may have flashbacks of when he maybe 
took his last breath, you know, or what he was hearing, wearing. So all of those are triggers um, mm -hmm. um, for you. Yeah. And then, Doc, if I could also add that sometimes in the process of certain types of therapy, um, it can be considered necessary or essential or helpful by the therapist to say, we have to go back to the place of the trauma and in a safe way, in a, safe, in a systematic way. Yeah. Yes. So don't overwhelm a client. Right. So sometimes, for example, there was someone I was supporting who experienced um, a trauma and they were not able to even name what happened to them. They were using context tools for the first five sessions. It was just become a girl good school, St. Jager High School, by the way, that I was able to, to, to pick up, you know, what, what their issue was because verbalizing it was too painful. And so obviously with a client like that, you can't just say, okay, so I did, I did something for you. Tell me what you were wearing. No. It's a systematic process. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's essential to take the person through. And yes. with you as their guide, helping them to realize that right now, I am not at that place anymore. In this moment, I am safe. So I can think about the experience. I can even name it. I know, and I can talk true. about aspects of it and know that I am safe. And that is a crucial piece of the healing journey. And I think for, for Doreen experiencing something like that, I definitely would suggest that she'd have, have to have someone guide her through this. For sure. That's not mm -hmm. like a trauma or a pain that you're just going to get up and sift your way through. Because they're, number one, you're going to go through the different levels of grieving, you know, and then no, because of how it happened, there is no trauma on top of that, you know. So I, I, I definitely would um, you know, say that uh, that's one of those things that, some guidance would be would be appreciated and welcome in that situation. Absolutely. Yeah. So the questions come in and we have more meat to chew on, mm -hmm. but I want to finish up just our segment break with the second question. I mean, the giveaway for you all here. When I want to give, but they look very calm and very, <laughs> like, you know, and they look rich, like we're gonna need them things. They want want Amazon gift card too? Yeah. All right. So here is the question, Dr. Blaffy. Here is the question for the in-studio audience. Doc mentioned, should I give them a hard one? No. I look so brilliant girl okay so who can tell me what is the name what is the title of the next life class in the series i want the order good sir you see that so we can give you yeah <laughs> congratulations the shame I know the voice. Congratulations, the Shane. Mm -hmm. When you come again, my like when I, when I don't bad night, right? <laughs> so the Shane has one for himself, an Amazon gift card. You can shop me, courtesy of the JN Group. Congratulations, boss man. So mm -hmm. the title of the next live class happening July 20 is The Vows, Yours, Mine, or Ours. Mm -hmm. Understanding boundaries in relationships. Lord, we have one good. Understanding <laughs> boundaries in relationships, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to come back into the second segment of our conversation. And we're going to talk about, let me start with Sarita because she's ready. We're, we're going to talk about what hurts us, especially in our Jamaican and Caribbean context, because we have so much aspects of our culture that to me, I think are problematic. And a lot of the things as Doc, as Doc said earlier, we normalize them. You say, oh, we used to get beaten with, with pipe. What are we used to do? We must wear bad. And, and, in, and even in, 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 in responding to it, what is that saying to somebody? there is a certain way that you can be that warrants you being beaten mm -hmm. to the point of having scars on your body and other such things, right? right. So I'm going to come to um, Sarita, in your experience, what are some of the things mm -hmm. in our culture that you think causes or contributes to people being traumatized? Oh, well, to be honest, I actually think that our society on a whole is dramatic. Um, <laughs> I think we, we have, as a, as a people, we have... Um, we have it ingrained in our in our psyche that we must be a certain way. Um, so men are supposed to be hard all the time. Men are not supposed to be emotional. They're not supposed to be soft because you know that that not look good, right? Okay. Um, and then we we have uh, the tough love kind of parenting that can really be traumatic for a child. And I would have mentioned it earlier, where we have parents who degrade their children, which is actually emotional 
really traumatizing to the child and it will it will you know it travels with the child as they grow older it's harder for them to be confident in the workplace mm-hmm. we see that popping up we see it popping up in relationships we see it popping up in you know just the way that they think of themselves and their confidence but it's not something that's talked about because it's 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 normalized like that's just mm-hmm. like the way I raise my kid is my business right but um I think that that is something that is really a part of our culture that needs to change. Um, and I mean, even things like catcalling, that can be really traumatizing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, like you're walking on the road and I baby love. And then the thing about it is it gets disrespectful at some point. And then women or whoever, you know, is the, the victim of the catcalling, they, they're sometimes hypervigilant. Like they don't want to go certain places at some, at, at certain times, they have to be looking behind somebody following me. Are they going to do something to me? So, I mean, things like those, which are not the big, the larger, um, you know, uh, situations, but they're, they're, they're so regular yes. that we almost just think of them as a normal part of life. Yeah. And I mean, unfortunately, it's just um, our culture. Yeah. And as a member of the life class community, I believe that we can just start to change mindsets one person at a time. And that's why we did it. That's why we up here at our after seven and nine, right? Because we believe that if we can change the way we respond to somebody to starting tomorrow, we can start to you know build that ripple effect of change. When you mentioned cat calling, my mind went to something that I'm experiencing a lot now, which is uh, maybe not traumatizing, but it's upsetting. How many people are driving out, especially in Kingston, and you have to, especially as a woman, be telling the windscreen wipers no 15 yes. times in a 24 mm-hmm. hour period? Yeah. And to me, it's starting to feel like not only disrespect, but it's starting to feel like a violation of my physical boundaries. Yes. Let me tell you no. Why you're up, what we are, put your face on the glass and blow me kiss. Yes. The kiss and the heart, they draw the heart. They draw the heart in the water or in the soap. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel as though, especially as women, we're targeted more because women are supposed to be tired, we're supposed to be soft. Mm-hmm. And if you look like you have look at Empress, whether you bite or, or, or you grow it, then your ears say, you know, you are supposed to clean and you're supposed to give them a money. And every single day this is happening. I imagine, for example, a person who has been maybe physically or sexually assaulted and having something like which may seem very yes. pedestrian it could be very triggering it could be them. very triggering mm-hmm. because every day you have to be telling a man no, no. Yeah. and they're not hearing the no you follow what i'm saying yes, so I'm there's so many you. elements yeah. of it that i think are just floating around out there and, and are so key yes in the process of sharing i i know from a good birdie that doc um in her book wrote about migration and that personally experienced migration and you know how it can affect us i don't know if doc would say that the experience traumatized her but i leave her to tell her story that help us better understand how migration um you know can impact persons whether it is that you migrate with the family or that you are maybe a child or one of the children who is left behind by parents who you know go to greener pastures yeah so all right so in my book, um, I focus mainly on serial migration, which is a type of migration where the parent leaves and go to a foreign country or wherever um, for a period of time. So there's a separation. And then we have the reunification, which would be years later or some time after. And that was my experience when I was 10 years old. Um, my mother um, left for the United States. And I was not reunited until I was 20, 22 or 23, somewhere. So that was a long time. Mm-hmm. And um, so we, I, have, I went through the separation. And when my mom left, there was some anger and some um, resentment because I was very young. And at that time, I was about to do common entrance and I needed her a lot. And that affected my schooling so academically i did not do very well at all i actually took um common entrance twice and did not pass at all so my grades begin to um began to fail you know began to drop and um there was a lot of abandonment a lot of rejection that came along with that so for me it was very traumatic because and even though she's told me she was leaving and she would come back Mm -hmm. it was months before i saw her again so for a child, just imagine how confusing that was. 
and then I, I, the, the the preparation period was not very um was not very long so I, she would have told me for example the this week and by the following week she was gone wow. for a child just imagine the confusion the shock mm -hmm. the anger so that was definitely traumatic for me and for a very long time every time she would come because she would come maybe once a year and visit there was a level of abandonment every time she would leave mm -hmm. you know so I, I i over the years i actually um you know struggled with abandonment um, as a result of that. And, and that is the, the experience of a lot of Caribbean um, people. Migration, we migrate as a people for better opportunities, for greener pastures. And oftentimes the, the entire family may not migrate. So there may be some level of separation and then reunification comes after. Mm -hmm. But even when reunification comes, that itself can be traumatic because you grew up without this person the bond was disrupted and now you have to work on reestablishing that bond. Yeah. And so um, that's where my, my, my interest um, peaked. And when I, re when I was reunited with her, I went overseas and did my master's and my doctorate mm -hmm. um, there. And it was during that time that I, in my doctoral dissertation, I interviewed other Caribbean nationals who experienced the same thing, who experienced the separation and the reunification later and hear their stories as well. Mm, so that. that's kind of where my, 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 my interest came from. Yeah, so, so in many ways, that is sitting as a real life testimony of trauma to try. Definitely. Yeah, and we love that. Yeah. And, and so much yeah. good has come out of you overcoming that experience. Right? Definitely. The in life class talking to the things then. Mm -hmm. But two, you have also captured the stories of others. Yeah. And I would like telling stories the way that we actually get power over our experiences as well. So I'm so glad that happened for you. The comments are just a beautiful part of affirmation. Mm -hmm. I had seen Michaela early say, listen, get this one TV. We need this one TV mm -hmm. right now, right? She said between mm -hmm. 8 and 11 p.m. She was so specific. And I love that this is so valuable to the 170 plus person mm -hmm. who are watching us this evening. Yeah. And Kiki, so yeah, microphone in hand. What do you think are some of the other aspects of our culture? that are sources of trauma that maybe we don't even realize too tough. Music. Mm -hmm. um, um, cutting up two half for me and half of you mm -hmm. is mine. I don't know where you get that from. You have a problem. <laughs> we really have a problem. Mm -hmm. It's mine. Mm -hmm. So um, that for me is a major source because music is so powerful. I mean, it's one of the first things you learn when you go to school. They're teaching you ABC, yeah, they're teaching you how to sing in song. Music infiltrates music speaks to our soul music either speaks to you or on your behalf mm. it is huge and it's one of those areas that just kind of goes under the radar you know um dance hall culture in its rawest rawest form was meant for the dance hall not necessarily for airplay we had radio mm. songs and if you wanted to go to the dance hall that is where you'd go and hear those type of music. But now it's one big open playing field. And no matter how much you try to protect the children or claim you're protecting the children, it's like second nature. And what happened then was there's been a consistent breakdown of families. There's been a consistent breakdown of moral values in society. And the more you see it evident in terms of the breakdown, you know, the family structure not there, the children are now being influenced by so many different avenues. This thing is becoming real. So it's not like a, 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 a Admiral Bailey back in the day or a super cat or, you know what I mean, who are singing certain songs and for them it's just entertainment. It's a little bit of, you know, art imitating life, so to speak, but there was a moral line, yeah? So it's almost, for example, it's throwback just a little bit, even in terms of, um, politics. I'm bringing this up because it's very relevant, not because me are neither are, because I really am not, right? But it's very relevant. So when I was in the 80s, when I was a child, um, oftentimes we know that political violence would happen around politics time, yeah, election time. So that's when Mr. Man over here said, I forgot like the ends because somebody tell him, saying, I feel like ends because somebody I win the vote then. Right, but that's the only time Mr. Man go up the ends, and Mr. Man is literally protecting his community. Get me, I say. So Mr. Man, as much as he's doing something wrong, still had a moral line that he never cross. Right, good. 
But if you live by the gun, you die by the gun, no so. So now Mr. Man's son have access to him gun, but Mr. Man's son don't necessarily understand the morals that right. Mr. Man did have. Yeah. So then now Mr. Man's son a little bit more carefree with it. You understand a little bit more. Yeah, now the man. Okay, live by the gun. You die by the gun. No, Mr. Man's son dead. No, Mr. Man's son, son take up the gun. Younger, more carefree, no morals at all. And it just keep passing down. Yeah. So then now when you hear the music, didn't have to use my gun today. I didn't have to kill no one today. And so I can almost safely say that today was a good after a long time them sang that singing. Mm -hmm. Right? But what's happening now is there are no more barriers. So the children and the younger generation mm -hmm. are living what they are hearing. Mm -hmm. I may have a problem with that. Going to pick me is 18 or 15 and brainwash completely and have a gun. I said the mother man and can just take out people's life just so. And the, the, the story or the narrative is nobody cares about me. Society don't care about me, so why me must care about them? Mm -hmm. And this thing is going on and on. When you see a 15, 14 year old girl performing oral sex and she's quite fine with it because of how society has just normalized. And you know, we're just, we're women as women, we're in the same categories as cars and guns and money. Bling. Chiching and itches. That's what we're known as the divine creatures that we are. That's just how we are positioned now. Yeah. And so when we hear the music and we dance, with, I'm a dancing tepe. My ear one, doom, doom, I'm ready. My body ready. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. And then when we start hearing me dancing, we say, oh no, oh no, 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 Some not anymore. <laughs> Mm -mm. stop it like the entertainment value is going but we do it all the time watch and we're done mm. it's because i'm so aware i can sit down and watch the audience and watch how the dj just have everybody just and lead them and play the soca everybody revel yeah yeah them ready play the gunman tune everybody turn dark and i'm just watching the energetic shift Play the girl skin out tune, every girl skin, start skin out. Yeah, man. Hey. And I'm just saying, what are we doing in the name of entertainment? Because everybody is playing a part to cheapen their own worth in this. And what we way more aware. So that's my never issue. Trauma, never issue. Okay. Real. Well, you know, Kate, you made a point about how some of these behaviors are how we call it, sliding down, shifting down from generation to generation. And even if people don't agree, because I know persons have different views about why art really is imitating life. So mm -hmm. we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be shooting the messengers who are telling us what's going on. Mm -hmm. But even if we don't, even if we diverge or diverge from your um, views there, there is another school doc that maybe you can speak to as well about epigenetics, which is where we are literally storing trauma in our genes. That's where, I, that's where I'm at. And passing them that's down. That's where I'm at. <laughs> and this is where intergenerational trauma becomes real. Very much. And so it's not an if or a but or a supposed, it, it is a scientific, empirically founded um, reality that there, in many ways we're storing things in our systems, in our bodies. And then it's just my generation and then you come. And if there's any reason, Dr. Cahoon, why I am passionate about doing the work I do, is because I want to see at least a slowing down of the intergenerational traumatizing. Like, when, when does it stop? We're all broken. That's the first thing we all need to understand. So we need to get rid of this hypocrisy of judgment. I'm perfect. You're not. Mm -hmm. I'm saying my, I'm perfect inside. I really am. I know I'm broken. So now may I try to project my perfection on you. And it's like a whole comparison. But just understand, we're all broken. Can we just mm -hmm. have a little compassion for each other, please? You broken, I'm broken, somebody's broken, places, just different but... places. Right. So, broken. so it's almost like I always say, yo, I might not have all the pieces of my puzzle together, but I might have a piece that can help you complete yours. And I'm hoping you might have a piece that can help me complete mine. But let's just get over the hypocrisy of, oh, I'm just so perfect. I'm floating on cloud nine because I'm just so, hum, let's stop it. Do whatever we're broken. They will just have to play our part in healing as best as we can. Amen. Because if we don't heal, it all starts with us. And that's what we need to get. You see, the longer we stay, stay, going over the trauma that happened to us and the longer it holds us captive is the more we perpetuate 
somebody else not being able to heal because they don't know what it look like or what it feel like or what it's supposed to be like. Yeah. Let healing not be the anomaly, That's but it. the norm. Underline that somebody put that on a t-shirt. Wow. Like healing should not be the unknown, it should be the norm because we have to heal not just for ourselves. Like everybody is put here. I and this is just my my one sense because it no means there's a general belief. But I just think if I'm here in a human form, it means I'm supposed to make this place a little bit better before my dead. If I'm a mother, even worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's stop the brokenness with us. Pay attention to our brokenness and stop projecting it on people. It's almost like if and I say it all the time, if I have a gun to my head and you come up and pull the trigger, how am I going to turn to you and curse you about you pulling the trigger? Didn't I have a gun to my head in the first place? That is what it feels like sometimes. Yes, someone did something to you, it's unfair, but now you're walking around with this wound and you're bleeding on people who didn't cut you in the first place. You know, really, right? Thank you. Some solid words there, Doc. What are your thoughts on this thing of passing the trauma down and you know, just having a cycle. Yeah, so as you mentioned about intergenerational cycle where we have trauma passed down from one generation to another. And the thing about it, if we don't make a conscious effort to stop it, to interrupt it, it's going to continue because we know that hurting people hurt people, yes. right? And I've oftentimes hear that, but I, I came up with the opposite. Heal, healed people, heal people. So if, if you amen, right? So if you heal yourself, you will become a healer. And, you know, we just need to stop it. As I think Kiki said, yeah. we really just need to stop it. We need to stop inflicting the wound. Not, not because it happened to you. You have to pass it on. Mm -hmm. You can be that, that change, mm -hmm. you know, and interrupt that. Yeah. And, and, and I think it takes self-awareness because sometimes we're not even mindful, you know. And that's why even sometimes in family therapy, I'll do a genogram and mm -hmm. I ask people to tell me about your generation from your grandmother, your great grandmother. What are some of the patterns in your family system that you see? And I'll help them to connect it. And I, I said, see, that is it. Abuse started there. But are you going to continue it? There was alcoholism in your family background, but do you have to continue it? Mm -hmm. There was incest there, but you can expose it. And you can I expose it and you can do something different. different. Yeah, I think hmm? it's so simple, but sometimes people don't realize that they can make a different choice. And that is the danger of, of growing up in a traumatic environment. Right. A traumatizing environment. Because it's in such subtle ways we believe that I saw my mother do this. I, I remember hearing somebody tell a story about the fact that they would ask their, their mom, why do you cut off the end of the, some piece of meat before you cook it, before it's in the pan? And she said, Oh, because I saw my mother do it. And they went and interviewed their grandmother and said, why do you cut off the end of this before you put it in the baking tray? I saw my mother, mother did it. Because I saw my mother do it. And when they cracked the code, it was because at the time, the, the, the baking container or whatever was, was too small. small. So, they used to cut so it, it was a scarcity issue. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. And now mm -hmm. them have big everlasting food door ovens and still cutting it okay, off because what? Somebody before me taught me that this is how it should be done. You know, here... Yeah. Here's 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 an interesting when it comes yeah. on to trauma as well is the fact that a lot of us are sad and angry because we yet we still don't know who we are yet mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because we're still living by the narrative of who people told us yeah. we were and to carry that burden around is heavy for anybody to know that you feel like an imposter in your own life and what I mean by that is we were raised by mommy and daddy or grandma or whoever it was, auntie. And how we were raised was a reflection or will be a reflection of whoever our caregivers were. Mm -hmm. So even when it comes on to trauma, I usually ask you know, persons to just get a piece of paper, draw a little baby on it, yeah? And on either side, write down, make a list, good qualities, not so good qualities mm -hmm. of anybody who you are, in, you are left in their care. So if it's mommy on one side, daddy on the other side, write down all of mommy's good qualities, write down all of mommy's not so good qualities, write down all of daddy's good qualities and his not so good qualities or grandma, whoever it was that would have had an influence in your life at such a, a young age. And then really step back and look at the list and say, all right, how much of this is really me? Mm. Because you'd be surprised. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the same thing that's upsetting about somebody is really you. The same things that somebody do that like triggering you. It's 
really you. You behave that way in another form, in another, in another environment. And you don't even realize it yet. You understand? So make a list. And then when you look at that, you know, have to say, all right, how can, I don't really want this anymore. That, that's, the, that's the part you were talking I about. Don't, yeah, I don't choice. really want this anymore. Mm -hmm. Am I going to consciously make an effort to oh, yeah. heal this now? You know, Great. healing looks like prior to healing, somebody did something to you, and you from zero to 100, I cut you, I cut them through. Yeah. Healing is, ooh, you know, that rubbed me the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Heal, it hurts. But now you can find the words to express it in a different way without guilting somebody, without losing your cool. Now you can honor yourself by just saying, that hurt, I didn't like how it made me feel a while ago. Can we talk about it? Mm -hmm. So it's not that things are going to get perfect when you're healed, but it's that your approach is going to be more harmonious for yourself and for others involved. And when you take that approach, it allows others to grow and heal as well. Yeah. And coming back to that point, that heals people, heals people, because we create healing energy. Sarita, there is a way that I have observed mm -hmm. that a lot of people are afraid almost, conflicted to say, you know, I have some trauma, or you know, when my mom, like, like it off, when my mom left, did it feel some type of way or it traumatized me? And guess why we, we feel a way to say it? Because we feel like becoming a big public life class for international Zoom, right? <laughs> Facebook. And tell people that, you know, my mom did or did not do as well in this. It, it feels like we are attacking them. Yes. And it feels like we are minimizing all the good qualities of them. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, it's another, another cycle of us not telling our story, us living another person's truth. Have you observed this as well? And how do you think it can affect people just in general? I have observed it. And just like you said, it's a fear of not wanting to um, speak bad about the other person. And I saw a meme on Instagram the other day that said, how many person's characters have you protected by not speaking your truth? And I think so many people are afraid of speaking their truth. But I mean, my advice Somebody is- Somebody in the audience, that one. <laughs> Speak the truth, speak your truth. It's your truth. You don't, you don't, it doesn't have to be said in a way that is disrespectful towards the other person, but it's your truth. This is what you did. This is what has happened. And this is how it affected me. Um, and I think that that's a part of the healing journey because we have to accept what it is that was done to us. We have to accept how what it is that was done to us impacted us. We're not expecting the person to apologize, but we're, I'm just, we're saying you know, this, you didn't do this, I'm going to feel away about it, and I'm moving forward in my journey, so uh, we have to speak, we have to speak our truth. There's no way around it. No There's way. No way. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's sure. any technique that can get us to healing without but, talking the truth of the matter, but, like honesty and, and authenticity is crucial. But to there's also journey. another, another part of that, we also have to be clear about how it is that we're speaking about the other person as well. You hear what I'm saying? The what so is let's, important let's and the talk, whole. Yeah, so let's talk about now, if you're a child and your mother or your father abused you, that's something that is just a given right there. You know, you never had any role in that, any input in that. But let us say that you're not going to walk around and everything for your stories and they beat me and it was horrible and you should have saw them they deal with me and I know everybody in the audience is going to know empathize with you. Mm, horrible, evil, mommy and daddy for dead. How oh, them can't do that to you? But truthfully, I could also equally see that my mom and my dad didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. They honestly didn't. Mm -hmm. And as such, it caused me pain. But I'm even more saddened at the fact that they probably went through the same thing. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. So in telling your story, be very aware. You don't need to tell your story and bash and tear down and paint somebody again as the villain. So they meet for dead or whatever it is. There's a way that it can be done. One way fuels it even more. Because when them share for them story and you're all up in arms with for them parents, you just don't take on for them issues of being judgmental on people who were broken. Mm -hmm. There's no healing in that. But when you bring awareness to it, and even in conflict you now, when adults go, you know, it's almost like for me, if I sit down and hear a girlfriend of mine, I don't really have that many, but you know, when I hear women, 
I know, and it's not a disrespect to women. Oh God, please. No, I'm just saying, I don't really have a lot of, a lot of, you know, you like go hang out with girlfriends and stuff. But yeah, I have a couple of them. But it's almost like when I hear women say, and the man, and the man, and the man. And I sit and I listen and I say, uh-huh. But if you're with him, it means that you're attracted to him. So birds of a feather flock together. So let's not focus on the man only. Let me hear what are you doing in this whole scenario as well. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So we we'll have to be very careful in how we share, just to make sure that there's some level of fairness. If it's adult to adult, there's fairness to where you are acknowledging your role as well, instead of just always painting people. Because we love blame. I hope you know this. Everybody, I don't know if it's a society thing, but it's a human thing. It's a human thing. We love blame. Uh -uh. Growth is, let me check me first. Let me speak the truth, but at least acknowledge what it really was. Yeah, because unless your parents are really downright evil and come from hell, men are really think them did intentionally mean to scare you for life. But here's me. Here is where I'm going to push back delicately and I'm lovingly. <laughs> Always, <Love>. right? <laughs> because I think sometimes there's truth in what you're saying, but I think especially when we start, when we just start with the healing journey. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the perspective shifting doesn't come as naturally. When I reach, just say yes. And, and it's a good aspiration to have. That's the first thing. And I think sometimes, too, there can be a narrative similar to the whole thing of, oh, but mommy really loved me, you know, so I'm not supposed to feel like, you know, we're going to what they do. Speak up. But I think sometimes, too, even in romantic relationships, sometimes we have a way because we understand why the person is the way they are. We start to already make excuses for them. So again, I think balance is the name of the game because we can understand that your mother before you, right, beat you with tree limb mm -hmm. and rubber and tire rubber, right? You had a responsibility to heal before you brought me into the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And it does not negate the impact of what you did. Because mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm raising it too is because sometimes when we may go into a confrontation with, a, with our, like Dr. Cahoon as our mediator in family therapy, we may hear mom say, well, you know, say me never get no love as a child. So pretty much like what you expect from me. And there is a shirking of responsibility. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So there is beauty in empathizing and shifting to say, well, you know, say maybe you never have it for me though, honestly. But it does not negate. That's, what, that's the point I wanted to make. That, it does not negate the impact. Right. That's true. So, right. that, so that's, again, is what we're talking about. Love is to heal. Yeah. So the first part of it, you want to speak your truth. And you're gonna throw them under the bus. And you're gonna say, oh, they mess up my life and whatever. But then after you go through and go ideally. through, ideally, you're going to end up on another, another level of healing mm -hmm. where you might not even turn around and say, no, like they really never happened to give me at all. Yeah. So Omega sit down and hold them accountable and carry them around in my heart for so long when they're genuinely just never, them did all need some parenting themselves after all. Exactly. Yeah. So if a girl and I hug up my mother and say, be yes. all right. Yeah, you look like you need some money. You need somebody preparing. So, you know what I mean? Not my mom specifically. I'm just saying. Like sometimes I don't get to the point after you heal and you're able to say, yo, no, but oh God, sir, you, did, you really didn't need somebody for hug you. And, you know what I mean? Like, and, and the generation before us, and I'm just gonna talk it, the generation before us, not can show up responsibility like this. You don't, you cannot, like it's not everybody, but majority of the people that I talk to, my age group, 40s, 50s, they're not gonna tell you. The, the parents not going to acknowledge you. Right. The parents are going to just be like somebody in the comments. I, I just because yeah. that's how the parents were raised. Yes. Mm -hmm. They were raised to do certain things. Responsibility. Do yes. this work. Provide for the child. The, them no care about nothing else. Our generation now come on about what tell me how you're feeling. And I love come that. Come and hug me. <laughs> right. <laughs> Our parents. Yo, yeah. my mother was thinks that kill me. I try to kill her every time I tell my story. I promise you. What? Love you, mommy. What's for real? Because they just weren't aware of yeah. that. I thought them honestly just yes. not have it to give. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's absolutely true. And it goes back to what you were saying earlier that, you know, that part of things comes later. Um, in the initial stage when we're talking our truth we don't even know what we're talking about we're just talking about the fact that we're traumatized we're Angry. abused yeah. yeah we're upset and then it's after when we're going through the healing process when we're going through all of the layers and we're peeling back we realize that our parents were also traumatized our parents also had mental illnesses that they didn't even realize that, that they knows. had and then you start looking at them differently to say they really didn't know any better yeah. But we have to get to that level within ourselves first before we can 
you know, empathize with the abusers or the traumatizers. Or yes. yes. So just to underscore the reality, another unsexy truth, we're, we're killing them with unsexy, unsexiness <laughs> tonight, right? That sometimes trauma comes at the hands of people that we love. Yes. And sometimes the conflict of that alone can just leave us like, you know, let me never talk about this because if me ever go up on the international TV and go tell them, say, my father never did, or my mother used to, or my ex husband used to, mm-hmm. like, oh God, that the father, right? Then I'm going to look bad like me and let down the family. Yes. And I'm sure, what I bet money said, Doc, there's a lot of that kind of family responsibility narrative in therapy, in family therapy, right, Doc? Yes, there is definitely a lot of that. Mm-hmm. So, um, do you want me to share a, a little bit about narrative therapy? Yeah. No, okay. no, not, and, not, not yet about the narrative therapy. Um, I want to leave that for like all, the, the last few minutes as a little mm-hmm. token for them. But just about, you know, the, the warped ideas of loyalty, for example, in a family. That, you know, if you really are a true Wilson, mm-hmm. right? Or Johnson, you're not going to blow the whistle. Yes. So sometimes bad things, ha- bad things happen in families. And for generations, nobody not tell teacher. Nobody not tell Dr. Kahoon, nobody not tell TK, no, no, because it's loyalty. Where lo- mm-hmm. love means that we cover all sins and we keep it right here in the family, right? So that, but is I that true though, you know? Is, is, is that true? Not necessarily so, because I believe what is shareable is bearable. Ooh. So if you, can, if you can share it, then you can bear it. Yeah. And, you know, it, it depends on how you tell your story. Because, for example, I, I shared about my narrative and how it affected me. But the other part of it, that was that was the trauma or the terror. But the triumph came later mm-hmm. where I got the opportunity for higher education, mm-hmm. you know, and to go overseas to study. Yeah. You know, and honestly, I don't regret any of it. I don't regret my mom leaving. It's one of the best decisions she ever made for our family. Mm-hmm. When I was a child, I didn't understand that. But... Later, I see the economic benefits, the educational benefits, the socioeconomic benefits. Mm-hmm. You know, so so triumph tri- triumph came from that. Victory came from that. Mm-hmm. And so it's okay to talk about things. We don't have to hush hush, because shame keep you bound. But when you share your story, it brings freedom, brings liberty. Yeah. And shame thrives in secrecy. That's yes. one of the things too. Yes, it, it does. Culture. Yeah. It does. You mentioned something earlier when you were talking about, you know, the fact that even our parents might have been dealing with mental health issues that went undiagnosed. And it wasn't until two years ago that I learned that my father um, and the men in my family, the older men actually suffer from psychotic rages. So when my father was physically abusing me and, you know, like machete and slapped me and beat me and all of these things, mm-hmm. I didn't realize that my father was suffering from a psychotic rage, meaning he wasn't even aware wow. of what he was doing. He could have killed me. Thankfully, I'm still here. But what that taught me was to mimic a behavior that was not natural. So I had to unpack that whole thing of, oh, but now I'm now left with a temper. Mm-hmm. Now I'm now left with thinking that I have to fight for everything. You know what I mean? I know I have to. My father is dead. He died 20 odd years ago. Whose responsibility is it? To know clean up the mess because I can't run to him and say you did and you did and you did. You know what I'm saying? So it's like perspective. If your parents or the person who hurt you is no longer here, yeah, then where are you gonna put the blame? Mm. And that ties into your point earlier about making the choice. Yeah. Because and sometimes too Kiki, thank you for sharing so vulnerably. But sometimes it's not that the person is no longer around you to death. Sometimes they just decide to say, oh we don't talk to you. Mm-hmm. You know, in a new conversation about 1995. I understand it. Close the chapter. The chapter and they're, they're over it, with it. And, you're and, and you're left with it. And, and, and another unsexy truth is that sometimes we have to create the closure that we need yes. by yes. ourselves. And I think for me, the closure, even where that's concerned, was because of the abuse, I would have known how to be overly understanding and forgiving of men. No, thankfully, the mother of boys, you know what I mean? But a man wouldn't, he, he, I was always understanding. So even before I'm apologizing, but don't preach to the priority, say, I just go on. But I remembered having to accept the truth. And it was one of the most painful moments for me, which was, Kerry, your father was incapable or incapable of loving you the way you deserve to be loved. Mm-hmm. And you can't walk around expecting that type of love from anybody else. 
That's it. And I had to sit down and sit with that. I chop more and chop up a bed. I lay down in the bed and I say, why me, Jesus? And I remember once I was able to just sit with that and accept it, I was like, all right, I got this. Yeah, I got this. And, mm-hmm. and sometimes we hurt more with, because we think that maybe like a parent or a key figure was unwilling to give oh, us what we needed. Yes. But sometimes that people just say they're incapable. And right. when, when, when we break it down into Jamaican language, it becomes clearer. Sometimes mm-hmm. they don't have it to give you. So you want 2000 US tomorrow morning and they have $2 Jamaican. They literally don't have the emotional currency. Right. So and people, right. people can't give what they don't have. Exactly. Exactly. And I see Claudine Allen in the comments just preempting our next segment talking about workplace trauma, which we want to touch on uh, before we segue. But before, go ahead, Tanika, because I want to segue into just naming again some of the experiences that many people have and don't know that it can cause trauma. But go ahead. I wanted to talk a little bit about the what Kiki would have shared. Um, about the men in her family mm-hmm. and you know their experience with psychotic rage is that what you call it um i find that in our culture a lot of men are struggling with it may be psychotic rage it might be anxiety it might be depression so many different mental illnesses and because of the pressure of society they're so hesitant to seek help yes. so all of these issues go undiagnosed and mm-hmm. whether they do they pass it on to their families and so many of the larger um, incidences that we're seeing the more serious issues for example of domestic violence the murder suicides I'd like to think that if those men were verbal about what it is that they were going through, perhaps the situation wouldn't have escalated to that level. But because society says men aren't supposed to be weak, because if you're weak, you know what you are. If you if you voice a certain right. thing, you chat too much, mm-hmm. and man is supposed to talk too much. Like that's not a thing. That's manly. It's not masculine. There's this. There's this. Um, expectation of what masculinity looks like and it's not a mental illness it's not being vulnerable Mm. so many men are afraid to voice what it is that they're going through I mean there's there are a lot of men in our society that are actually struggling with mental illnesses there was actually a report last year that said that the uh the, the instances of suicide are actually higher among men and it's just really sad that the society I blame society for this really because it's based on the pressures that they place on our men, why they feel that they need to struggle in silence, why, you know, the cycle just goes on and on because nobody's healing. Everybody is just, it's just commonplace. Mm-hmm. You know, we spoke Absolutely. about epigenetics earlier and just things being passed on. And one of the things that I'd like to highlight, I don't know how many of us are aware that even from the days of slavery, prior to slavery being introduced to us if someone had a mental health issue the community would usually help them through it mm-hmm. the community would whatever rally. they do yeah. rally whether it's love whether it's herbs the mother burn whether it's prayers. Kumbaya, yeah. prayers but they had a community however when slavery was implemented the slave owners any anybody who displayed any type of mental health issue was literally burned for everybody to see now, you tell me what you think that's going to do to anybody's psyche. Yeah. Now, you come in and you have a man who has his wife and his daughter and his mother, and he's seen them raped and he's seen them beaten and he's seen them sold. sold and he's seen all of these things and it's coming down and it's coming down. So we've had a lot of men who are present in the home and being applauded for physically being present in the home. But them not raise your one behind. Because mm-hmm. they ain't present at all emotionally, emotionally, because I'm emotionally here to give money to your host, and you can't tell where daddy is because yeah. daddy is gone. Daddy will sit down, watch TV, be serious, house, drink a juice, smoke a cigarette, yeah. if anything, Checked crack out. a one and two joke, gone. Ba-choo! But daddy was there. So there are a lot of issues that have gone unresolved, unnoticed, undiscussed, and it's just been passed down. So then again, now we come and we tell the boys, Manu, be strong. But ironically, 
equally as women, we're still seeking the validation from the men who are broken. Yes. And we make mm. it so easier for them to have access to us because we're trying to be validated in our own brokenness and they understand to the man they're broken to. Mm -hmm. So if you don't stand up for them in yourself as a woman and heal your ish, you're going to continue passing that on to a man who don't even know the first thing about healing because he's expecting his healing through you. Because if you hold him accountable because you're healing and you're saying, no, this can't work, mm -mm -mm -mm, or maybe you're not for me, changes aside, like the dynamics completely. Mm -hmm. Now men would start saying, oh, but if me need, mm -mm, I don't need to get, mm -mm, it's for me to work by myself, then hmm, it might motivate me. Mm -hmm. But we're making it way too easy. Mm -hmm. I think there's a whole cycle. A whole cycle. Wow. And coming back to Selita's point, I was in a space with men, or only men sharing. I was the only woman that was permitted in the room. And one of the things that struck me to my face was when one of the men said that he reached a point in his struggles with his mental health where he thought suicide was it. And he mentioned this to his female partner. And good sis turned to him and said, don't you ever name this, speak this again. Argument done, chapter closed, book lock. That's it. And you see when that one man shared, other men just started to jump in and say, me too, pretty much. Yeah. One man said he told his wife that he was at the end of his role and her only response was wow. Well. And so, especially because we're driving to solutions for this last segment of our conversation, I want to just invite the women, those who are partnered with men, to just remember that they have feelings too, they have challenges too. And just because you may not hear it said does not mean that they're not over there struggling. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's something important to bear in mind. We're almost out of time. So I'm going to run a little bit quickly um, to just, just to capture some of the aspects of where trauma can come from to wrap up this second, second segment. Sometimes trauma can come from accidents. If you have a name that's all now. Sometimes yes. car accidents or other types of accidents that, um, that can also lead to trauma. Right. Medical crises, medical diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Anybody ever have invasive surgery? Sometimes mm -hmm. they can leave you feeling yep. some types of ways, right? Yes. You see some scars. Um, witnessing or experiencing violence, mm -hmm. including domestic violence, mm -hmm. is also a possible source of trauma. Losing a loved one to death, prolonged right. illness. Some people have lifelong or you know chronic conditions, right? Parental abandonment or rejection is another one. Imprisonment, incarceration. Mm -hmm. Or having a family, a close family member being incarcerated, racial trauma, and other adjustments to migration, doc. Right? You're, yeah. the, you're the darkest one in the class. Mm -hmm. You're the only black kid in the whole school in PF135, right? Mm -hmm. um, abuse of all kinds, natural disasters, mm -hmm. terrorism, COVID. COVID. Oh, God. COVID. I'm tired, I'm tired already. Just no, hearing no that. No longer trauma, no drama. Listen, <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm done. I'm maxed out. Right. 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 Some of us have um, had parents who raised us in a very frightened way because of their own PTSD or their own challenges. Right. And out of their being frightened, they were frightening. Because sometimes, sometimes when people are scared, they're very angry and very controlling at the heart of it, right? I want to touch on one more. Well, two more non traumatic bullying or sometimes traumatic bullying. Yes, definitely. Including social media wars, doc. Mm -hmm. People bullying mm -hmm. people and so people are spread people voice mm -hmm. notes mm -hmm. and videos of people in different acts, right? That can right. be hugely tra traumatizing mm -hmm. as well. And two that we don't talk about enough divorce. Mm -hmm. Yes, and infidelity too. Mm -hmm. The big eye, right? Yes. yes. And as Claudine mentioned in the comments, workplace induced emotional trauma. Some people in our parking lot are cry every other morning before they go in. Mm -hmm. Panic attack in a, after every start meeting. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's a war zone. And there are mm -hmm. many people whose trauma is even playing, like previous trauma playing out at work. So right. case, we have a lot of trauma in the work. Whether, whether the workplace is causing it or we're bringing our stuff, right, to the workplace and the trauma is just, um, is just coming forward. So just in case it is that you've experienced any of those, we're in the solution aspect of our convo. We want you to be able to walk away and say, hmm, light bulb moment went off in life, in life class today. Let me process if any of these have left me um, with, with some residual trauma. 
Before we go into our final giveaway, I want to invite the tech team to launch our post-class poll. We want to hear if you get what you come from some life class, and we want to hear how you're doing. So just go ahead and complete it, and I'll read the responses for you in a few minutes. And in our Q&A box um, for Doc, somebody's asking, would you recommend that teachers provide advice to students when they come to them about a traumatic experience or should they refer them to professional counselors? And that's for Dr. Cahoon specifically. Unless the teacher has some training in trauma or counseling background, mental health background, I would say yes. Other than that, I would say a refer to a mental health professional. Mm -hmm. And yeah. not even a, ch a church, because I think sometimes we refer to lay people, but they're just not trained adequately to deal with certain things. And then not all counselors or therapists are trained in trauma focus and understand how to deal with this. Absolutely. So okay. I think it's important to refer to the right people. Mm -hmm. Just like if you have a toothache, you're not going to go see an oncologist. Listen. You know, exactly. you're going yeah. to go to the expert <laughs> yeah. who specializes in, 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 in teeth. A dentist is yeah. the same thing. And Doc, I know sometimes people take offense when I tell them not to go to pastor or bishop or evangelist because they feel something like the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus mm -hmm. is the qualification that we need to do everything and anything. And while I do believe in Philippians 3, exactly, you know, we can do all things. I believe we can do all things to a certain extent, right? Exactly. I'm not going to go to my pastor for surgery because I'm don't train. Exactly. Him. That's not his specialty. Okay. But the Bible also says in the multitude of counsel, seek wise counsel. Oh, no, sis. Yes. The Bible says that. So you have to know what counsel and when Absolutely. and who. Yes. So it's so important. Well, and I stand by her, right? So Doc, I want you to share now a little bit about the narrative therapy because a lot of the conversation in terms of how we can move from trauma to triumph is about reframing the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves mm -hmm. and reframing what we believe our trauma means about us. So please mm -hmm. Doc, take over and teach us. Teach us your ways. <laughs> so... I, one of, narrative therapy is one of my favorite because what narrative therapy um, does not do, it does not transform the per person in therapy. What it aims to do is to transform the effect of a problem. So for example, you have alcohol problem. Instead of seeing yourself as the alcoholic, and we love to label, and I'm an alcoholic, see yourself as the person with a problem with alcoholism. Mm -hmm. So it's important for us to understand that we need to make space between a person and their issue. So the person is the person, the problem is the problem. Mm -hmm. So we need to learn to separate the two. And that is called externalization. We, we like to internalize things, but what we need to do is to externalize where we learn to separate. Mm -hmm. So we will say, oh, a person is a schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. That's a term we use, but instead we can change that to say the person has schizophrenia. Yeah. When you do that, you can, you can become empowered to overcome this issue, to put the illness in remission there. Mm -hmm. And so it's very important for us to deconstruct how we name the problem, how we view the problem. So it's important to put a label to the problem. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things with narrative as well is that we want to deconstruct the dominant stories. The stories that the society brings on, these stereotypes, by naming it, by tracing the history of it, where it started, explore the effect of it on you, the problem that is, putting it into context, and then you can also discover what we call unique outcomes. Mm -hmm. So for example, I experienced that of early abandonment due to my mom's migration issue, right? But the unique outcomes was that it benefited me and my family in the long run. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is the unique outcome that came from my story. Mm -hmm. So even though it hurt, even though there was a lot of trauma and terror, triumph came from that. 
So it's important for us to also reauthor the problematic dominant stories. Mm, All right. And when we do that, we help clients to bring forward the unique outcomes again, right? Those previously unprivileged aspects of their experience, the trauma and identity, and then bring out those. And those mm. become the alternative story. And it's important, as we say, in narrative therapy to thicken, right? And to, to exaggerate the alternative story, which, is, which are the triumphs. So you were abused as a child. Instead of just seeing yourself as an abuser, see yourself as an overcomer. Mm. Those experiences, yes, they broke you. Yes, you were broken, I understand. But okay, what good could come from that? What lessons you learned from that? Mm-hmm. How can you use your story to inspire someone else? Rather than just seeing yourself as a victim for the rest of your life. So that it sounds like a transition from victim to to even survivor. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Overcomer. Language is so powerful. Overcomer. The language is what is different. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't change the fact that you went through this and that it was painful. Exactly. Exactly. We're We're not negating that fact, you know. Mm-hmm. But the way in which you're telling it and remembering it is different, mm-hmm. right? So you're reauthoring. So mm-hmm. I also see our life as a book. All of us have a book and we have different chapters. Mm-hmm. Your childhood and that abuse chapter is closed. Now you open a new chapter as you become an adult. What are you going to write? What are you going to author going That's forward? Yeah. You are the author. You can become the author of your story from here on. When you were a child, you were not able to protect yourself from that abuser, that, that, that perpetrator. But now you are older. You have a voice. You can protect yourself anymore. No. Mm-hmm. You don't have to continue to open yourself to that abuse. I love this. I so love you can reauthor that and have new stories, new yeah. chapters. Mm-hmm. And that in some schools of therapy, we call that reparenting our inner child. Because you realize that the parents that we needed when we were nine and 10 or seven mm-hmm. and, and six, they were not the ones. They never have it. And now we have to imagine giving ourselves mm-hmm. what we needed mm-hmm. back then. Because exactly. we are the ones who are coming to save ourselves. Exactly. So final thoughts. And then Sarita will share her final bits of wisdom. And then we will give, up, give away something else. Um, one of the, the, the most challenging things when it comes on to trauma is having persons who have gone through trauma, especially women, feel like they are worthy. One of the hardest things for mm-hmm. a woman to actually say to herself, having gone through trauma, I am worthy. Yeah. Because it, they take it so personal. They literally think there's something wrong with them. Internalized shame. Mm-hmm. And that's the area that I think they need to work on first. Yeah. In understanding that there's nothing wrong with them. But you want to hear the crazy things? A hundred people can tell you that there's nothing wrong with them until they're able to find a way to come to that realization for themselves, put some logic, reframe it, reparent, use a different narrative. But until you're able to do that for yourself, it's going to feel like healing is just out of the picture for you because right. of how hard you feel as a person on the inside. You're not as bad. It's you, you, like if you could see you through the eyes of so many people who love you, you'd be amazed to know that you've just been half of your life beating up on yourself, beating up on yourself, beating up on yourself, mm-hmm. when you could have been loving yourself yeah. beyond what someone who was broken might have done to you. It's almost like, for example, if a half if half of a person walk in this room right now, what half of them would I do? If somebody walk in here, half of them alone is walking out. Almighty, yeah. almighty, we got no so. Well, picture the parents who raised you as half of a person. Mm-hmm. Picture the parents who raised you as half of a person. Mm-hmm. No matter take on the book and this half of them raising you. Try and finish the next half of yourself. And I saw this this morning and I just thought it was so amazing when I heard it. So quickly, who is the most, who is deemed as the king of the jungle? The lion. Everybody goes to the lion, don't you? Did you all know that lions are not the strongest animal? They aren't even the fastest. They don't have the longest lifespan. They aren't the smartest. And they don't even have accuracy in hunting alone. But yet still, they are the most feared. You want to know why? Because one, even though they might not be the strongest, they're the most ferocious. 
They are calculated, strategic, and patient, so speed doesn't matter for them. They're an apex predator, so no other animal will hunt them. And they live equal parts relaxing and playing and hunting. And they hunt in packs to improve their accuracy. Mm -hmm. I say all of that to say that their strength, they're stacked, the odds are stacked against them. You hear about a while ago? The odds are stacked against them. But who or how they were naturally created overpowers all the odds that are against them. So you can never tell a lion that it's not the strongest. You can never walk and tell a lion you're not the most accurate because it knows that none of those things matter. What matters is what it has. It has everything it needs mm -hmm. and whatever it has that it needs, it can provide for it getting what it wants. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that, Kiki. I love that Kiki uh, just mentioned the lion because um, as a self-soothing practice, I love to watch wildlife documentaries. Mm -hmm. And something that I've noticed across the animal kingdom is the sense of community. Um, we, find, we see how elephants stick together as a herd and the matriarch passes down the knowledge. Um, we see the lions hunt together, the cheetahs hunt together, and even the prey stick together because they know that there is strength in the numbers. And if you, if the lion catch you one side by yourself, that's it, you're like you're gone. Mm -hmm. But in the human kingdom, we tend to be alone by ourselves. We feel like there is strength in singularity mm -hmm. and we want to fix it on our own, but we don't have to. There are so many other people out there who are experiencing the same struggle that we are experiencing, persons who have gone through what we are going through, that we can rely on, that we can find strength from. So I want to encourage our listeners today, anybody who is struggling with, be it a mental illness or somebody who is has experienced trauma, um, to seek out a community, find someone to talk to. Um, for, for persons who have experienced trauma, I would for sure recommend that you speak to a mental health professional um, or a professional who is trained in dealing with trauma. But talking about it is one of the first steps to actually healing because there is power in your words. There is strength in talking about the struggle. You don't need to struggle in silence. You don't need to suffer in silence. Not at all. Um, so I encourage anybody who is going through anything right now, just to reach out to somebody. If, if it is that you are not sure who, you know, who to talk to, we have two wonderful, um, clinical psychologists on, on online that you can reach out to. I don't know, message them on oh, Instagram, so, <laughs> or drop up in, in the comments, or you can just speak to a friend, reach out to somebody. Google is your best friend. I mean, I find my, I think of myself as a graduate from the University of Google. Um, <laughs> there's a wide director of persons that you can speak to, but I just want to say, don't struggle in, don't sit in silence um, reach out to someone, share your story. And because that is the first, one of the first step on the healing journey. Talking like an advocate par excellence. Thank you so much, Sarita. As Donna Edwards King says, a problem shared is already solved. And I Amen. to put a pin there. Let us pull up the event of our Thriver Meetup um, poll, post-class poll, because we're a little bit over, but the conversation just is nice and powerful. So my mood has improved since the start of the class. 91% of you said either yes or sort of. That's a win for me because the numbers were, you know, not so high when we just started. The panelist experience has given me a better understanding of what trauma is. This is what, no, 99% of you either said yes or sort of. Number three, I feel more hopeful. Remember the whole piece? I feel more hopeful that I can recover from past traumatic and difficult experiences. Everybody said either yes or sort of. And panelists, Patting yourself on the shoulder, because that's a win for the work you have done this evening. You go, Doc. <laughs> Number four, I received the tools to start or continue my journey of healing from my past. 95% of you said yes. And finally, I received what a comfort from life class this evening, and 99% of our respondents said yes. I'm going to put my hands together for that. I would say it was a very successful class. We want to give away one thing. To our virtual audience, if you can name that particular structure of the brain that got mentioned, that's a very key activation center in traumatic experiences. Anybody can remember? The, the area of the brain. 
Oh God, Omar, come on, Omar. Oh, oh, he sold the reading. Awesome. How many people are, are on it? I see Roxanne and she's dropped some powerful comments all night. I see even though I didn't, I didn't have a chance to amplify them. Roxanne, big up yourself. Uh -huh. Michaelia, Donna, and Omar have been just in the comments just doing a whale mm -hmm. of powerful work and sharing. I want to say thank you to our in-studio audience in the company. I want to say super big thanks to the entire JN group and the team that you don't see, Celia, Pilar, Kevin, Whitney, Claudine, every single one of you, the tech team, right? JNTV, big up on yourself, please, and thank you. We love your support. And to our amazing panelists and those who showed up from 180 plus persons tonight, we got so much positive affirmations for how powerful this conversation was. So can we have a round of applause for our beautiful panelists this evening? And I'm reminding us that we're going to be back in this powerful space on July 20th, Wednesday, July 20th, at what time? 6.30 p.m. And we're going to be talking about the marriage piece. So come back, tag a friend, and let's keep the energy going. On behalf of all of us here, thank you again for coming to episode two. And I can't wait to see you all next time. Much love and take care of the good self. Mm. Bye, everybody. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you so much, Doc. You're welcome. Thank you guys as well. So good. And get some rest, please. <laughs> Will do. Thank you. Hope to meet you soon. All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>